Amen. So, the topic of our message right now, today, is can you see what we have there? The millennial kingdom. And I have good news and bad news. The good news is that the millennial kingdom is wonderful. The bad news is that we're not there yet. You really want to tell me that some of you think this is the millennial kingdom right now? If that's the millennial kingdom, I'm super disappointed. I'm going to tell you folks... First of all, we're going to ask ourselves, what is the millennial kingdom? Because that's a very, very controversial thing. And then we're going to look into the rest of it. So what is the millennial kingdom? Let's, let's look at Revelation chapter 20, which is the portion that speaks of that in the New Testament. Verses 1 to 6. Again, it's the New Testament portion that speaks of the millennial kingdom. And John is writing, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So the term thousand, millennium, thousand, mille, is a thousand in Latin. The term millennium is already Referring to the time that Satan will spend in the bottomless pit. And then he says, And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and he shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Wow. So, there is going to be a point at the end of the tribulation, Satan is roaring. Satan is, 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 is doing what he knows how to do. He's deceiving the nations. Where God is going to throw him into a bottomless pit. And he will shut him up. Shut up, Satan. And he will seal him all the way that he cannot, the Bible says, that he will no more deceive the nations until, say until, until. the thousand years are finished. This is the key. I want you to remember, you cannot take the Bible only in parts and leave the other uh, uh, outside. There is a word that says until. That means there is a time frame where the world will be free of satanic presence. But that time frame is limited for how long? A thousand years. Now watch this. But after these things, he must, say the word must. Must be, the word must here is the key to my whole message. I want you to understand. So remember that, circle that in your Bible. He must be released for a little while, say a little while. See, God is going to test the world after a whole thousand years of no satanic presence. He's releasing him. He must be released for a short time. Now watch this. And I saw thrones... And they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or the image, and had not received the mark for, uh, 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 on the forehead or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a, what? Thousand years. 
Again, the term millennium in the Latin, mille, thousand. So, thousand years is the time that Satan will be in the bottomless pit. And it's parallel to that is the time that the saints will reign with Christ. Where? Here, on earth. Watch this. But the rest of the dead did not live until, say until, the thousand years were finished. Wow. So watch this. God is setting a time period where he's going to free the world from satanic presence. There is, and we're going to talk about it in a, future, in a few sentences, uh, what it's going to look like. It's amazing. This is, pff, are you kidding me? Millennial? I'm going to tell you what the millennial kingdom is going to look like. You're going to understand why we're certainly not there right now. But I want you to understand, no more satanic presence for a thousand years. Satan must be released for a short time at the very end. And at the very end... After all of that, only then all the people who ever lived throughout history, who died already, are going to resurrect, the Bible says. The rest of the, of the people of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay, what is the first resurrection? I, uh, I, I promise that I'm going to show you. I don't know if I can. You guys help me out and move to slide 22 and show them the difference between. Watch this. There is the order of the resurrection. There is the first resurrection and there is the second resurrection. The first resurrection is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and those who belong to Jesus. You've got the, on the third day, Jesus resurrected. He was the first person. The Bible says he's the first fruits from those who, who, were, who fell asleep. Then before the tribulation, the church is going to resurrect. The dead in Christ will rise first. And we that are alive and remain will, will be with them. Remember? Then in the middle of the tribulation, we know that two witnesses that are going to be killed will resurrect. And then after Jacob's trouble, we know after Israel is back, we know that all the Old Testament saints are going to resurrect as well because they will be ushered into the millennial kingdom. It's going to be awesome. Guys, do you see King David right now? He's not here yet. Moses, Elijah, they're not here. They will be there in the millennial kingdom. You must understand that. And then you see in the beginning of the millennial kingdom, all the tribulation martyrs. You see, those who went through the tribulation and throughout the tribulation became believers, not that many, but they will also, the Bible says, they will resurrect and they will reign with Christ. Those who did not receive the mark of the beast. We just read about it. So the common here is they're all godly, not because of who they are, but because of who, is, who God is. And because they submitted their life to God, they became believers. And you're talking about all of that is known as the first resurrection. So resurrection is from the moment, first resurrection, from the moment Jesus resurrected to the moment the martyrs of the tribulation will be resurrected. This is the first resurrection. Then there is a thousand years gap. And at the end of that, there will be a second resurrection. Of all the unbelieving dead. That's what we just read. Now look what the Bible says. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Okay. Over such. The second death has no power. What is the second death? Look, 
Some of us are going to die. Some of the martyrs of tribulation will die, of course. The Old Testament martyrs have died. The two witnesses will die. This is a death that we know that has no power anymore. And when they resurrect, that's the first death. First death of a person. The second death is the death after God judges the whole world. And those, as Daniel says, some will go to have eternal life and some eternal damnation. That's it. It's final. Not all men are saved. Some will and some will not. Now God already knows. We don't. Because God knows all things. God knows things of the future, but we don't. And that is why he's going. We, we thank God that we do not have part in the second death. Only one. It is appointed upon man once to die, and then comes the judgment. The question is, what did you do in your life until you died? Will you deserve the second death? Or over you... The second death has no power. Amazing. So now we're going back to that, um, to the verses, to, to slide four. You can see over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. Millennium again appears here. And he talks about a time where we reign with Jesus. Physically, Jesus will be on earth. And we physically will be on earth. And we physically will reign on earth with him. Very important that you know that. Now, is the millennial kingdom... In the Old Testament, I just read to you the classic Old New Testament thing. But is it in the Old Testament? Well, I want to tell you something. I might surprise you, but there are more verses in the Old Testament about the Millennial Kingdom than in the New Testament. In fact, the Old Testament has more prophecies about the Millennial Kingdom than about the first coming of Jesus. You just need to understand. Zechariah 14, verses 6 to tw 16 to 20. At the end of that terrible war, the war that all of you call Armageddon. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts. Where? And keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that who is who so will not come up of the families of the earth unto where? Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. It's not the king of Israel, David. It's the king, the Lord of hosts. It's a term that only belongs to God. And if you're not going there, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt goes not up, then comes, come not that have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that could not come not to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord and the posts and, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. I told you, regarding the first coming of Jesus, there are over 300 prophecies, but some of them are repetitious, repetitious, which means if you really put them all, if you take away all of those that repeat themselves, there's about 109 prophecies about the first coming of Jesus. But there are way more than that relate to the second coming of the Lord's millennial reign. And all the first coming prophecies were literally fulfilled. And there is no reason to assume 
that the fulfillment of the second coming prophecies will not be will be any different. We need, therefore, to take the Old Testament seriously, and we need to study what it has to say prophetically about the end times. Now, the political side of the millennial kingdom, that's just so you understand how we're not there yet. First of all, the Bible says that the reign will be worldwide. The reign of the Lord will be worldwide. There will be one king over all the earth. Is that what we have today? No. Isaiah 2, 2, Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Then it will be peaceful in nature. Hello? Do we have peaceful reign over all the earth right now? No, but Isaiah 2, 4 says that. The world will be blessed with righteousness and justice. Huh? Is that what we have right now? Even in, in Manila, you can say it's not happening. Every mayor is more corrupt than the one before. Corruption is there. Sin is there. The Lord's throne will be established in Jerusalem, for He will occupy the throne of David. Is it there? Is the Temple Mount even in the hands of the Jews? Are they having their temple standing there already? No. His government will be theocratic one in which he will serve as king, legislator, and judge, according to Isaiah. Is that what we have today? Today, everybody's bowing down to supreme courts. They rule over governments. The redeemed will reign with the Lord as princes. Are you ruling already? No, not yet. And I'm not talking about now the natural aspect. I'm talking about the political aspect of it. Because the Lord will be reigning from Jerusalem. The nation of Israel will be the prime nation in the world. It's not the case right now. Everybody turn on CNN and see they, all, they talk about America. Most of the time. America today is the superpower in the world. It's the center of world's happening. Everything that happens there projects to the whole world. China is number two. Russia is number three. The, let's face it. Israel, with all that is amazing things that God is doing there, is not yet the prime nation in the world. What about the spiritual state in the millennial kingdom? The Bible says that the glory and holiness of the Lord will be manifested. Holiness will abound. And the attitude of joy and praise will prevail. And that's in Isaiah chapter 40 and 52 and 66 and chapter 4. Trans the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. With everlasting joy upon their heads. There will be gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. I'm sorry. Have you met the Jews lately? Sigh is our second name. Even our cows, when they produce milk, oh, they. A rebuilt temple in Jerusalem will serve as the worship center of the world. Is that really what we have there? We don't have it there yet. Isaiah 2, Isaiah 56, Isaiah 6, 60. Incredibly, the Shekinah glory of God will hover over the city of Jerusalem like a canopy in Isaiah 4, 5. It's not there yet. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Do we have it now? We have increased what? Knowledge. But we have deception, corruption, sin abounds. That's what we have right now. What about nature? Okay, I dare you to go now to Africa, to the area of the jungles where the lions are. And just try to walk right by them. Hi, kitty, kitty, kitty. Do that. The Bible says that the land of Israel will no longer be a place of desolation. True. Instead, the fruit of the earth will be a pride of Israel. Water will break forth from the wilderness. It started. 
But then it says that the animal kingdom will be restored to its original perfection. Poisonous animals will cease to be poisonous. Meat-eating animals will become herbivorous. You know, you know, can you imagine? Lions will be vegetarian. <laughs> you know, people ask me if I'm vegetarian. And I always tell them the steak that I eat is from a vegetarian cow. Hello. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, all members of the animal kingdom will live together in perfect peace with each other and with mankind. Is that what we have right now? Try and walk in the jungles. Try to go to, to a poisonous cobra or, or, and then, you know, if you want to die, if you have a death wish, but in the millennial kingdom, if you read Isaiah, both in chapter 11 and both in chapter 65, and trust me, I read those verses before I put them in this message. It's perfect description of how God is going to restore things. And remember, this is the time that Satan is not even here to deceive anyone. Remember, he's locked up right there in that bottomless pit for a thousand years. And mankind can no longer say there is a satanic influence in this world. So how come everybody's so deceived about this millennial kingdom? Don't you notice half of the pastors around the world believe that we're already there? I don't know if you know that. There's a great deception both among Christians and Jews. First of all, in the Jewish mindset, the millennial kingdom is the first coming of the Messiah. The Jews reject Jesus. Part of it is because they say, I'm sorry, but we don't see the things that should be here when Messiah should reign. See, they missed his visitation. What is a visitation? He, he's only coming for the issue of sin. He only comes for a short time. He is not staying. They miss that one. They are waiting for the second coming as if it's the first. They're waiting for the millennial kingdom as if this is the reign of Christ. So up until then, Messiah has not come yet. So in their mind, the enemy deceived them to say, reject Jesus. Obviously, he, ha he, never, he never really provided the world that you hope for when Messiah comes. So the Jewish mindset, what we call the second coming, they call the first coming. What we call the millennial kingdom, they call Israel's messianic period. So the enemy blinded them from understanding what the millennial kingdom is all about. And what about the church? I don't know if you know that. Most of the people that call themselves Christians today and most of the churches that call themselves Bible teaching churches today are amillennials. Amillennials mean they don't believe in a millennial. The amillennial viewpoint of end time Bible prophecy is the majority view within the church today held by both the Catholic Church and most mainline Protestant denominations. The enemy did a great job in deceiving them. Our millennialists are those who believe that Jesus is currently reigning over the world from heaven through the church. And they therefore believe that we are already in the millennium right now. That it began at the cross and will continue until the second coming. Ha! Huh. First of all, 2,000 years already passed with all the respect. So it's way beyond 1,000. And all the characteristics of the millennial kingdom obviously don't fit anything in this world today. Now, who is going to reign? The Bible, is it King David or King Jesus? Because I want to tell you something. Ezekiel 34, 
Watch this. It says, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, the Lord have spoken. Then in Jeremiah 30, verse 9, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So there's a lot of confusion amongst mostly Jews, but many Christians, as of who is the king in the millennial kingdom. Jesus or David. And I want to correct it. Very much so. Remember in the order of the resurrection, the Old Testament saints, amongst them David, are going to resurrect at the end of Jacob's trouble, ushering the beginning of the um, uh, millennial kingdom. The Jews, and now comes the point, the Jewish people sometimes refer to the Messiah as David because it was known that the Messiah would come from David's lineage. The New Testament often refers to Jesus as the son of David. Remember, in Matthew 15 and in Mark 10, there are other reasons besides uh, being the son of David that the Messiah is referred to as David. King David in the Old Testament was a man after God's own heart. Acts 13, what about the Jesus? He was unlikely, an unlikely king of God's own choosing. And the Spirit of God was upon him, as in 1 Samuel 16. David then is a type of Christ. A type is a person who foreshadows someone else. Another example, by the way, of this is the kind of typology is Elijah, whose ministry foreshadowed that of John the Baptist, to the extent that Malachi, or if you're Italian, you call him Malachi, he called John Elijah. Malachi 4, 5, we see Luke 1, 17, Mark 9, and all of that. Folks, make no mistake, David will be resurrected at the beginning of the millennium. Along with all the other Old Testament saints. And David will be one of those who reign with Jesus in the kingdom. Not the only one. However, all believers will rule the nations. And judge the world. The apostle Peter called the Christians a chosen race. A royal priesthood. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. A holy nation. In Revelation 3, 21, Jesus says about the believer who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. In some sense, then Christians will share authority with Christ as far as rulers. That's what Ephesians 2, 6 says. There's some biblical evidence, by the way, is in the parable of the ten minions. The Bible says that individuals will be given more or less authority in the kingdom according to how they handle the responsibilities God has given them now in this age. This is why it's so important to study about the millennial kingdom today. Jesus is the king of kings. Humanly speaking, Jesus is from the Davidic dynasty. But in power, in glory, in righteousness, and in every other way, he is rightly called the greater David. And the government will be on his shoulders, Isaiah 9, 6. That's the child that unto us is given. The Old and the New Testament reveal that the future king during the millennium and all eternity is Jesus Christ and him alone. Jeremiah 23, Isaiah 9, 7, Isaiah 33, 22, Revelation 17, 1 Timothy 6, 15. I love the Bible because the Bible explains the Bible. Where is he going to rule from? Jesus will return to this earth to reign from Jerusalem. This is why Jerusalem has to be back in the hands of the Jewish people. This is why they had to come back. This is why the moving in the embassy by President Trump, you may not take it 
lightly, but this, or you may take it too lightly, but this is a very prophetic thing. That the, the, the world superpower recognizes Jerusalem as the place for the people of Israel. It is the step before they will build the temple. Zechariah 14. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as they fight in the day of battle. And in that day, His feet shall stand on Mount of Olives which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north and the other towards the south. And then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee. And look what they say. Thus the Lord my my God will come and all the saints with you. Jesus will return to Jerusalem and he will return with all of us. I always tell people in the second coming of Jesus, you better not see his face but see his back. Because he will come and consume his enemies with the breath of his mouth. But if you are his Behind him riding the horse coming all the way down from heaven. You are with him. As much as I want to see the face of Jesus. I will see it when I come in the rapture. But then he takes me and I will be with him. And I, when I return he leads and I'm riding the horse behind him. You don't want to see his face. You want to see his back during that time. Is there any indication by the way of Israel's salvation during the millennial kingdom? Of course Zechariah 12.10 says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And then they will look on me whom they have pierced. When Jesus returns, Israel will be the ones that says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus said, Jerusalem, you will not see me until you say, Baruch Hashem Adonai. You will have to invite me. Hosea 5 says, in their affliction, they will earnestly seek my face. And that is after the tribulation that is meant for their salvation. They will earnestly seek him and they will, wa and they will cry, Baruch Abab Hashem Adonai. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for the firstborn. They will understand that for the last 2,000 years they were wrong. He is our Messiah. It's the one whom we pierce. It's the one whom we condemn. It's the one we thought that is not our king, is not our Messiah, is not not our deliverer. He is the Messiah. He is the deliverer. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I wish we would, have, we would have believed in Him and we would have been spared from this whole tribulation. And you, before the tribulation starts, have the privilege to choose Him. Jeremiah pictures the millennium as the time when Israel and Judah will be united in peace. The city of Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord. Jesus, the righteous branch, will reign as the king, act wisely and do justice and righteous in the land. Because of his new role as king, the name of Jesus will be changed to Adonai Tzidkenu. Yahweh Tzidkenu, which means the Lord is our righteous, righteousness in Jeremiah 23, 6. David, in his glorified body, will serve also as king of Israel. The Bible said that all the enemies of Israel will be destroyed, Jeremiah 30. The city of Jerusalem and the temple will be rebuilt, Jeremiah 30, 18. And the population will be multiplied and the mourning of the Jewish people will be turned into joy. The Jewish people will repent of the rejection of the Messiah and they will enter into a new covenant with God and they will be, as it is written, it will be written on their heart. Jeremiah 31, verse 31, talks about the new covenant. The New Testament that the Jewish people were promised. The streets of Jerusalem will be filled with a voice of joy and the voice of gladness. Now, who are we going to rule over? <laughs> it's nice to be rulers, but... You need to rule over someone. <laughs> it's not only animals, hello. Remember, when Jesus comes back, he will judge the sheep and the goats, remember. 
And he will allow the sheep to enter into his, the kingdom, the thousand years kingdom. And they will multiply. They, they still have their earthly bodies. We will have our glorified bodies because without that we cannot even be raptured. Remember, you cannot be raptured unless you are changed as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us are going to die, but all of us are going to change. In a minute, and with a twinkle of an eye, with the sound of the trumpet. But the people on earth, when we come back, they're still having their earthly bodies. You see, you can eat as many donuts as you want. They can't. <laughs> Hello? That enough is a reason to believe. That is enough is a reason to want to be taken. People throw millions of dollars on diets and wellness treatments and, and medical treatments. You receive Jesus and your body is going to be changed. But those that are going to be left here, those that are, when we come back are still on earth, they will repopulate the earth. After all the great tribulation, earth will be repopulated. And I know that because I'm going to tell you in a few seconds what's going to happen with those people. So can you imagine reigning a thousand years and you're going to see so many people born and dead and born and dead. You're going to, at the end of the millennial, you're going to say, hey, I know your great, 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 great grandfather. He was nicer than you. The people who survived the tribulation and their descendants are the people we're going to reign over. Zechariah 14 says, It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of Lords in Jerusalem. There will be people who are left. God will leave people and they will multiply. And what is going to be the dif different by the way, between the Jerusalem of today and the Jerusalem of the millennial kingdom. It's the same city. We're coming back to earthly Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is not yet there. But the millennial Jerusalem still is going to be a little different. First of all, the Bible says, there will be the river of life that is coming. Take a look at this. The river of life. Move forward and see in Ezekiel 47... The first 12 verses is, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the front of the temple faced east, and the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. And he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around to the outside. And when, you, he's talking about the water, and the water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters into the sea, and wherever they reach the sea, its waters are healed, and it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes, everything will live wherever the river goes, the river of life. By the way, Zechariah in chapter 14, you can add it, also speak of the same river. He says that when Jesus comes back and his feet are on Mount of Olives and Mount of Olives split, then water comes out. Half goes to the eastern sea and half goes to the western sea. And there will be a river in Jerusalem. Jerusalem has no river today. Jerusalem will have a river. Now Jerusalem has no temple today. But the Bible says in Ezekiel, the first, five chapter, Ezekiel 40 to 45, speaking of the fourth temple. Wait a minute. Fourth? Yes. The third temple is going to be built during the tribulation. When we're out, Antichrist will reign from it, remember? But when Jesus comes, everything is destroyed. There's an earthquake. And then there will be a fourth one. Now, I have a question for you. Isn't a millennium a long time? <laughs> it's like, all right, I got the point. I want to tell you something. We're changed, remember? Our bodies change. Everything is changed. The millennium will be millennium for those who live here. 
But remember, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 8 to 9, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. There is a great chance that for us it will feel almost like one day when in reality for the people it could be felt like a thousand years. Now comes the point. What is the purpose of this kingdom? Why would God want us to reign for a thousand years in this fallen world over these fallen people where Satan is not even over for good, but only for that time. Remember Jesus said in the, about the first coming, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came the first time to save the world. But the second coming in Acts 17, he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the men whom he has ordained. In Acts 17, 31, he will judge the world in righteousness. Now, if God is about to judge the whole world in righteousness... God wants to display His righteousness. Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 61. The truth has been preached in His first coming and will be displayed in His second coming. Yet what? The nations will still be ignorant. Okay, you can tell me that you did not believe when Jesus first came. Well, you know, He was... Poor, riding a donkey, weeping, crying. He died like a thief on a cross. This whole thing doesn't resonate with, with what you think a king is going to be. So maybe you missed him in his first coming. Okay? But you want to tell me that after a thousand years, when he comes riding a horse, destroying his enemies with the breath of his mouth, that he's establishing godly kingdom on earth. There is no Satan around. He is bound for a thousand years. You would think that everyone automatically will believe, wouldn't you? Hello? And you cannot say, Satan made me do that. Satan is not even there. He's locked down for a thousand years. He's gone. Stop blaming him for everything. Although Jesus spoke about his second coming, why is it so hard for people to believe it? Listen, people don't believe Jesus is coming back. Most Christians don't believe in a physical return of Jesus. I don't know if you know that. You know why? Because Jesus will come riding a horse. It's a political leadership that he's about to take. Don't you politicize my faith. I'm not. Jesus is coming as a political leader. Oh, I prefer him riding the donkey. It's your choice. He's coming back on a horse. I'm sorry. Jesus will come as a man of war that will consume his enemies. Folks, we love him as... The one on the cross who turns the other cheek and who bleeds and who forgives. I mean, we want him there on the cross or as a little baby. He is coming as a man of war. People have a hard time with that one. They don't want to see a political figure. They don't want to see someone who is coming to fight his enemies. Jesus will come no longer to save the world. That's his first coming. But to what? Judge the world. Oh, Jesus forgives. He loves. Jesus is coming to judge the world. The first coming is to save the world. You have a chance right now. But I have a 
News for you. He said that the second coming is not to save but to judge. The two judgments of the millennial kingdom, there will be two. One is going to be the sheep and the goats when he ushers the millennial kingdom. In Joel chapter 3 and in Matthew 25, Jesus will come and he will divide the population of the world between those. And by the way, in both cases is how they treated Israel. Interesting. That's why it's so important that we have pastors and leadership that are so much teaching you to love, support, and pray for Israel. The Bible says in Joel chapter 3, the following thing in regarding to that particular thing. It says, For behold, in those days, in that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on the account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They are also divided up my land and cast lots on my people. He will judge all the nations on the account of his people. What they did to his people. And Matthew, when he says sheep and goats, he says, If you did that to the least of my brethren, speaking of the Jewish people, it's as if you did it unto me. Wow. And then at the end of the millennium, it's the great white throne of judgment. That's when he judges the whole world. Two different judgments. One, look at this chart. Go all the way. The first one, when he returns with us, it's the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And then the second one, at the end of it, is going to be when he's judging the whole world, and the world that is not of him is going down. He is bringing new Jerusalem for us from heaven. Why is it so important for us today to study the events of such a far future, such as the millennial kingdom? It's important because your decision today will affect your place and your role in the future. If you choose him now, you reign with him in the future. You deny him now, he will deny you before the Father. It's very simple. That's why it's in the Bible. Why do you think John had that revelation if it's not that important for you today? Why do you think all the Old Testament prophets had that revelation if it's not that important? There are no promotions in the millennial kingdom. Either you reign or you're being reigned by someone. You're not promoted. <laughs> if you want to be promoted to governor or to be a priest, now your decision will make you priest and will make you judge and will make you a king and ruler in the future. But not then. A subject can never reign. You have to understand that. Follow Jesus today and you will reign with him tomorrow. Reject Jesus today and you may not even see tomorrow. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. This is faithful saying, For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. And if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. One of the questions I'm often asked is, can anyone accept Christ during the millennial kingdom? It's a leg legitimate question. A thousand years. They see Jesus. These people were not born when Jesus came first. You cannot blame them for rejecting Christ. Here they are in the millennial kingdom. Can they and I am going to be very super careful in my answer right now. And I will tell you this. All I can tell you is based on what I read in the scriptures. Salvation 
may be possible during the millennial because I, don't, I never met one person that Jesus said, oh, you truly want to believe, but I'm not interested. No. He's not interested in those who faked, who did this in his name and did that in his name. He never knew them because they never really truly believed in him. However, it's a huge however, you will not be there if you reject him now. <laughs> in other words, don't count on coming to faith in the millennial kingdom. Hello? You won't be there. Those who will be born during the millennial kingdom might have the chance. But you, that's why the Bible says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because if you did not receive the love of the truth now that you might be saved, you will be receiving from God, you will be uh, getting from God a strong delusion that you should believe the lie. You understand? Now you need to accept Him. The only description that we have of the world towards the end of that kingdom is not that flattering. You see, I didn't find all those verses that speak of if you're born in the millennial kingdom, you're saved and everything is. You know what I found? Revelation 20 verses 7 to 10. Look what I found. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison... Remember, he's there for a thousand years. And remember, the Bible says that he must be released for a short while. And now comes the point at the end of the millennial kingdom. The Bible says, Satan will be released from his prison. And what? He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Whoa. Gog and Magog? Yes. There's another Gog and Magog. This is the ultimate Gog and Magog. The coming of those who are influenced by Satan against those who are chosen by God. There's a picture of it in the coming Gog and Magog now with Ezekiel. But the ultimate Gog and Magog is in the end of the millennial kingdom. And guys, the Bible says... That they, he will gather them together to battle. Whose number is it? The sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. There will, that means that the saints, the believers, and the beloved city, Jerusalem, will be attacked from the four corners of the world by people who automatically, once Satan is released, will choose him. After a thousand years that Satan was bound, thousand years that Jesus physically reigns on earth, guess who they choose? Satan. And they came down from God. The Bible says, and they went up, and, 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 and the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So I'm telling you folks, when my Bible tells me that the Lord Jesus will judge the world in righteousness, it's because the world is going to be so evil and the millennial kingdom as far as I'm concerned is God telling all of us look guys I'm giving you a thousand years Satan is not in the neighborhood I am reigning over all the earth and guess what you're still going to choose Satan so when I judge you at the end it is in righteousness do you understand what the millennial kingdom is all about? A display of God and His righteousness in preparation for His judgment. This is why I cannot tell you, wait for the millennium 
to believe. Most likely, you will be deceived. This is why there is an urgency in the Bible in 2 Corinthians 6, the latter part of verse 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not then. And I beg all of you not to be deceived that the millennial kingdom is already here. I beg all of you to understand now is the day of salvation. If you will enter into the millennial kingdom, which is a very slim chance that you will, the chances that you will be deceived are even greater. Choose Jesus. Choose life. And reign with Him. And rule with Him. And live with Him. Not only for the seven years in heaven and the thousand years on earth, but also forever and ever in the new Jerusalem. Amen. Father, we thank you so much that you, by your wisdom in your mighty, mighty, mighty hand, you're going to judge the world in righteousness and you give us the millennial kingdom to understand how desperately wicked the heart of man and how he needs a new heart that can only come as he accepts Jesus and filled with the Spirit of God. So today, Father, we ask that you will fill us once again with the urgency of the times and the seasons, not only to be holy and live holy life, but also to tell people about Jesus. They are so going to be disappointed. And they are so going to be deceived when the Antichrist is going to rule and reign. Because he can only give them fake peace for a short time. And then comes the disappointment. Father, I pray that so many will come to the knowledge of the truth. So they will not be given to strong delusions. We pray that you will use us today. To share your word and bring fruits to your kingdom. We thank you for your word and for the millennial kingdom that is ahead of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.